Welcome to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast brought to you by SME Strategy. My name is Anthony Taylor and I'm going to be your host today. On the Strategy and Leadership Podcast, we interview senior leaders and thought leaders to get their best practices for leading teams, for driving and executing strategy, and other best practices as it relates to leadership and team development. And our goal here on the Strategy and Leadership Podcast is to bring you practical and executable tips that you can use right away to support the growth of your organization or your business. So if you enjoy today's episode, please be sure to subscribe. You can follow us on YouTube for other bonus content on strategy and leadership, or, and you can join in on the conversation on Facebook in the Strategy and Leadership community. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. I am super stoked for our guest today. Um, he's a graduate of Harvard Business School. He's the youngest CMO at a Fortune 500 company, became the CMO of Starwood Hotels. He's written two New York Times bestselling books. He is the CEO of Farazi Greenlight. I am joined today by Keith Ferrazzi, who is the leader or the author of Leading Without Authority, his newest book. And I'm personally just super stoked to talk to him and get a chance. Keith, how are you today? But I love your exuberance. I am overwhelmed and excited to be here as well. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, we, we started chatting about, obviously, we're going to talk about the book. You've written great books. You've done tons of research and things like that. Uh, what do you want to start off with, with telling people in the world? This is now, you know, during COVID, everybody's remote. What do you want to start off by telling people? What are you seeing in the world around you? Well, I think on a personal basis or on a company basis, I want you to look beyond the crisis for just a moment, um, look beyond the fear for just a moment, and I'd like you to activate around the following questions. Um, where can I find the unexpected growth opportunities for myself and my business? Where can I find the unexpected growth opportunities for myself and my business? And what I'm going to propose to you is that you will only find that by co-creating with an extraordinary group of people what the answer to that looks like. And I don't want to even call that your team, even though the chapter in my book, chapter one of my book is who's your team. And leadership today is all about you as a leader identifying a mission that you have, and it doesn't even have to be well-formed or well-shaped. You have a mission and a vision, as sketchy as it is, and then you have a network of people to fulfill it. And that's the group that you have to lead. And what I wanted to do in writing Leading Without Authority is to teach you how to methodically go about being an exponential leader in this era and be able to find that growth opportunity. And then the second piece is, and minimize the risk. And minimize the risk. I'm currently coaching the executive teams at uh, Verizon, Delta Airlines, and General Motors. And I'm, I've got a front row seat to some of the most extraordinary executives redefining the businesses that they're in on a no longer on a quarterly annual strategic planning cycle but on a weekly and sometimes daily agile sprints, which is all a part of what I wanna to bring to you, which is as a leader without authority, um, you really have to adopt three principles. Number one, you've gotta be transformational. You don't have the choice to be anything other. Um, you've gotta be radically adaptable. And we've gotta define the sprints of, of us to define what it is we're trying to achieve and how do we celebrate outcomes and how do we pivot as needed. How do we bring the market into our conversations? And third, you've got to be co-elevating. This is the word that I created a few years ago, a number of years ago, that is the anchor of leading without authority. The book co-elevation, the, the principle of co-elevation is you've got to get a group of people so committed to the same shared mission as you are that you've co-created together and, and this is the hook, and committed to each other and committed to each other. That is crucial committed to the each other piece and that's uh that's what i want to bring so thank you for giving me that long diatribe to start a call like this a conversation like this but um that's the passion i have there's this huge possibility in front of all of you huge possibility in front of all of you but um you can't do it alone yeah which is the first book that you wrote so how i got introduced to you is never eat alone 
great book. Encourage everybody, everybody who works with people to read it and, and about, you know, at its heart from what I remember, you know, building that community, having people around you and setting the foundation for what's neat as a thought leader, how your process perspectives on teamwork collaboration have evolved to maybe from a level of community to a level of team to a level of individual and then back out to see how like how you can mm, I want to say muster gather everybody to create something cool and what I really like is in your new book so the, the subtitle of the book is how the new power of co-elevation can break down silos transform teams and reinvent collaboration so what I want to touch on is, of course, the title, Leading Without Authority. Let's say for our leaders on the call, middle managers, senior leaders, um, even if you're just an employee and you see what's going on around you, you may or may not be in a system that has been set up over years that might be resistant to transform, whether that's because of culture or, or status. You know, what are some of the things that you can do in that uh, transformational mindset, defining the sprints, and then co-elevating the people around you. What practically can people say, hey, uh, tomorrow in my, or Monday in my all-hands meeting, I'm going to do this, and it's going to start getting the ball rolling and kicking people in the butt. Yeah. So, you know, this book was really written for two audiences. Um, one of the audiences is, frankly, me when I was 24. So when I was just a kid getting out of Harvard Business School and I went to Deloitte, there's a wonderful story about how I became chief marketing officer of Deloitte at a really stupid age, so young. Um, it was because I had asked the CEO a simple question. I said, hey, um, who, who do you, well, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want your legacy to be, right? And how are you going to fulfill that? And he said, well, I, I, someday I want to make sure that as a company, Deloitte is at par with Accenture, which is Anderson Consulting at the time. And McKinsey. And I, and I noted that. And I went back to Harvard Business School and I did a research project for one of my classes on professional services marketing. And it was an extraordinary in-depth research project. And I delivered it to him. And based, he was blown away. Nobody had ever done that before. And based on that, he invited me in to work with him on creating the future of marketing. And, he, and I said, would you make me the chief marketing officer? I do well at this. And he said, absolutely not. You're a child um, and you're not a partner. And I said, well, make me a partner. He's like, shut up and come in and work. I mean, you've read that story in, um, in Never Eat Alone. But ultimately, I became the youngest partner ever elected. And I became the chief marketing officer by the time I was 30. So that's just ridiculous. And then that, that gave me the foray over to Starwood Hotels. This book, Leading Without Authority, says if you have a vision, if you have a vision, I don't give a damn what your positional authority is, what your title is, how many resources you have, it is irrelevant. This is the formula for you to be an extraordinary leader. The same thing applies if you are a leader today by positional authority. If you are a titled leader, I'm working every day in organizations. We coach executive teams. That's what we do uh, for our company. So if you're a leader and you want your team to be extraordinary, you want your team to be co-elevating, you want your team to be transformational, radically adaptable, you hire for as a green light, and we coach teams through that process over a series of of very deep interventions around your strategy and help rebuild your strategy. And what I see constantly is executives battling with each other for who has control over resources. No, 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 I want this to report to me. I want this to report to me. And, and what they're saying is, I have a vision and for me to achieve my vision, I gotta get these resources. And what, what, the, real, what the reality is every moment that they're battling, is stealing from shareholders because it's, it's time that we, who gives a damn who reports anybody? I was just talking uh, to one of my clients and this gentleman has just been named the head of customer experience, but he doesn't have a loyalty program, right? He doesn't have um, traditional marketing and there's a bunch of things he doesn't have. And he was a little bit worried about that. I said, I don't give a damn. Our kickoff meeting, we're gonna invite all those people. Who cares? who they report to, we want to co-create with them a vision for the future of this company and its customer experience. Let's invite them in to co-create a vision and then let's collectively figure out what we're trying to achieve, where the resources are, and let's go get it done. And by the way, let's bring in 
a, a company from, let's bring in an executive from a company that isn't ours, that impacts your customer experience. Let's say it's travel, right? Let's, if you're an airline, let's go bring in a rideshare company, right? If you're an airline, let's bring in a hotel company. I don't give a damn about boundaries because you, your customers don't deserve a solution that has boundaries. You want to be boundaryless. So I call this one of the eight elements that we coach to in our work is called teaming out. So think of your team independent of the people that report to you. And again, that's chapter one in leading without authority. Who's your team? Redefining that. So, you know, my advice to you, first of all, is if you're a leader and you're thinking, how do I adopt this? First of all, I mean, the principles are in the book, but if, if you're a leader and thinking about how to adopt this, the first step is to imagine your vision for what you're trying to achieve, but be malleable enough to know that as you're inviting people in to quote your team, you're really inviting them into their team. Inviting right? yourself into their team or no, no, inviting? No. Okay, well, I just wanna make sure I got if that. you're inviting somebody into your team, so I'm the chief marketing officer and I have this vision for what I think we need to be doing, but it requires the chief product officer to be involved. So I'm gonna go over to the chief product officer and I'm gonna say, what am I gonna say? Am I gonna say, come on board to my team? No, I'm gonna say, let's co-create a radically new way of serving our customers. I've got market data, right? I have access to distribution channel of marketing. I maybe own channels, I don't know. You own product. You understand what the future of technology is. Let's co-create a robust and transformational solution. You have not invited them into your team. You've invited them into their own team. It's their team. Ownership hmm. is the... I affect you, but what I'm about to say sounds like a great tweet, but ownership, right, is the enemy of transformation. And what we've got to start realizing is that leading without authority requires us to have a, uh, have a much greater focus on transformational outcomes than it does on pride of authorship. Because inclusion, diversity and inclusion, it used to be hiring diverse populations and checking the box and making sure the right people are in the seats. But today, diversity and inclusion is, is more about making sure that you hear a radically diverse set of opinions that will allow you to create exponentially. And you're not going to get those in your, in your own head. You're not going to get them in your own team. You're not going to get them in your own company. You're going to get them wherever you need them. And you know, so again, the answer is start by asking who needs to be involved in this process. Who's your team? Then you're going to go on a path to invite them into your team. So a lot of people are busy. They're busier than you are maybe, and they don't have time for your crap. And so how do you make your crap their crap, right? How do you invite somebody in so that it's their uh, shared passion and shared priority? There's a, there's a, um, chapter in the book called Serve, Share, and Care. And it's how do you open other people to your vision so that it becomes their vision? And how do, you, how do you enlist those individuals? But then ultimately, then you've got to start getting on a path of co-creation, getting on a path of agile sprints every week, every month, depending upon the audaciousness of your vision, what's the time in between meetings that allow you to achieve extraordinary things that you can process and then pivot and then process then pivot. These days, companies are doing weekly agile sprints. You know, team, whether, you, whether you call it that or not, I had a call this morning with the chief, the head of HR at Unilever, and we're writing, he and I are writing a piece on white collar agile and how he's been applying it and the things he's been able to do. What used to take six months to, to ship a product to market, he's doing in what did he say? It was literally a 20 day period, 20 days. He got hand sanitizer on the shelves and they've never sold hand sanitizer in the United States. He got a hand sanitizer on the shelves in the United States in like 20 days. So and that with, was with that example, 
Um, cause you know, there's a lot of, if you're a small business, you're pivoting and you can like drive that transformation. If you are, um, that kind of company, you need to move that. What are some of the, I got the co-creation, I've got the making the, you know, somebody else's problem, your problem, sort of not caring about who owns it or who had the idea and in your words, the authorship of it. I'm interested to hear about the ownership as in who's going to drive it versus, you know, one of the big problems is when nobody owns a, a thing, then it doesn't move. But what are some of the other conditions within an organization? So if you're looking at it systemically, what are some of the other conditions that need to be present so that you can go from six months to 20 days on the shelf in either a corporate organization and I would argue maybe smaller or maybe harder in, in a smaller organization. But what is the system that needs to be in place other than a desire to, to be co, uh, co-creative? Well, here's the thing. If you involve enough people in your co-creation, you've got the, you've got the support of the masses in your ability to break down policy walls, defy tradition, et cetera. Right. So yesterday I um, was coaching a large insurance company. We do all this remote, by the way. I I have found that coaching in a remote world has become a an extraordinary way to reinvent the business quickly. And I've lots of webinars. I actually, if if your people are interested, I created a website called virtualteamswin.com. Virtualteamswin.com. And to have lots of best practices around leading virtual teams through transformation. And um, so I was coaching this, this insurance company, very stodgy, very old school, you know, cycle times of change of a decade. <laughs> I mean, and the, I got this team agitated and excited to be transformational and leverage, frankly, the moment. I mean, this is a moment where your companies, every company out there proved that it can be transformational. No company in the world didn't just go through a radical transformation. Now, some might be out of business, but if you're still in business and you just weathered the, you know, the, the, ISO, the uh, social distancing, you went through pretty radical transformation. So let's leverage that. And so we, you, we leveraged that. And despite all the suffering, of course, that are associated with this, my, you know, my family's from Italy and uh, you know, I've seen a lot of suffering. Um, and with respect to that, this crisis is an opportunity. And if you if you leverage this time and say we're gonna, what's the next audacious thing we're going to do? Right? We just did an audacious thing by getting people to all work remote. What's the next one? How about let's keep them remote? Let's reduce our our footprint of real estate um, by eighty percent. Right? Let's. Um, uh, let's reduce overhead as a result by 30%, right? Um, let's redefine our product suite. So asking your team to co-create the answer to the question, what's the next outrageous thing we're going to do, right? And today is the day that we can actually do it. So th- I got this team to come up with some crazy ass stuff. And they committed yesterday to go for it. They're going to accelerate. They had transformational plans because everyone's trying to be transformational these days. They have had transfer, the same set of transformational plans for five years, which they've avoided achieving. And, and I think they're going to change in 90 days stuff they have been incapable of changing in, in, in five years. So the leapfrog possibility right now. Now, what I'm trying to do, and I wrote a piece on at LinkedIn. You can go to Keith Ferrazzi at LinkedIn. But I wrote a piece called, let's not go back to work. And I wasn't just meaning, let's not go back to headquarters. I was meaning, let's not go back to old ways without rethinking them all. Mm-hmm. And I said, my, my, so I created a foundation, it's a nonprofit called Go Forward to Work. And I just hired a managing editor from, a uh, former managing editor of Forbes. And we have hired writers and we're, we're going to be finding all of the radical innovations that have happened in two months that allow us to rethink and reboot what um, our business looks like in the future. We have been bullshitting ourselves and talking about the future of work for 20 years. 
and more of his, his more of the future of work has happened in two months than has happened in 20 years. Well, that, that's sort of my, and I got it like there's that, that meme where he says like, who's led your digital disruption or your digital transformation? And, it, and it's been COVID putting all of these things in place. And, you know, I sit here when, depending on where you are in the world, certain places are, are, are starting to loosen restrictions and people are starting to get back to work and life is going back to whatever it's going to. And then people are going to be left in a state. They're going to be left in a state where they are online doing whatever they need to do. And then they're just going to like, you know, be operationally focused. They're going to be potentially in a bucket of people that are saying, hey, what's next? How do we move forward? But eventually there is going to be a, a state of maybe not inertia, but, you know, like where there is a new constant. And, I and, hope and, not. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what do you think? And, I mean, if we were to, to hypothesize. Going, so the threshold of, like, I have been a seeker all of my life. All my life, I have constantly wanted to get better and reinvent myself. Partially because I have so much that I need to reinvent and get better about, right? <laughs> so when you come from such a low, you've got a lot of work to do. So you damn well have to make it a priority. Um, and I just am sad when I see others who don't have the same seeker mindset. Um, so maybe there are those who are relishing and looking forward to, when I say slowing down, I want to get to that for a moment because that's about energy. And I want, I do recognize that we've been pushing ourselves, uh, for the last two months in ways that may not be un, may not be sustainable. So I'm going to put that off for a moment. But the pace of change has to continue at this pace. Why not? Why not? Now, it doesn't mean you have to continue to work nights, weekends, and constantly in front of Zoom all your life, right? But I'm suggesting that you have an opportunity to continue an expectation of this pace of change. Now, how do you leverage that? How do you weigh that against the exhaustion that many people feel, the lack of boundaries that people have seen. I think we're going to figure that out. One of the spaces that I'm looking at um, is what does balance look like in a post-COVID era? Because I, we, have had, we have had a lot of boundary violations in the last two months. Um, some of them have been lovely. I mean, we're not commuting anymore, so we're at our Zoom and we're doing lots of work. And um, some of it's been really effective and necessary, you know, from zero to 60, maybe that required some weekend work. Um, I have not taken any weekends. I have not taken any weekends. I'm pivoting my business left and right. I'm constantly uh, figuring out how do I move from only serving the Fortune 500? How do I serve companies that are $50 million plus? And I've, and I've created info products because I've had the time to do so. I've hired coaches that use my methodology now at all levels of companies. I've reinvented my company in two months. It's been a huge blessing. And my team has been there the whole time. Um, and not just been there, that my team has led the whole time. I've been so blessed to have a team of innovators with me this whole time, but that's because of how I lead. If you lead without authority and you give others authority, and you celebrate others for their innovations and you don't stop people when they've made mistakes, et cetera, um, these are all things that allow us to, to move forward in a very, very, very powerful way. Um, so um, the pace of innovation has changed and we need to keep it up. That I think is necessary as a competency of leadership going forward in the future. Yeah. So, okay. So can, the pace of change, adapting to that, recognizing the, the changes that have been done to you, I have sort of two, two parallel tracks around the co-creating and around the redefining our team. And you had mentioned you wrote your book for 25 year old you. So I was trying to get the, the balance between, and this is sort of going back to our original conversation is like, you know, that entitlement mentality. If some people have like an entitlement, I'm getting the sense that like the millennials that want to 
like they take, they co-create, they want to work on things. They feel like they're entitled to more than they have potentially. I don't necessarily feel that way, but if that perspective was thought of, you know, what would you say to 25 year olds who want to take this on, um, you know, what is the sort of the mindset, the approach and the steps that they need to take. And then I'm going to go the other end of the spectrum. Uh, yeah. Look, I mean, it's, it's, it's what I wrote about. But by um, the book is the answer no, to that question. No. By the book. No, but let me walk you through the chapter. I mean, really, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite straightforward. Um, you've got to have a customer facing customer first vision for how you want to serve and contribute to the organization you're working with, right? So meaning that, like I asked Pat Lacanto what his legacy wanted to be, and he told me it was really brand oriented and aspirational to McKinsey and Accenture. That became a fuzzy part of my North Star. Now I had to go figure out how it would contribute to that, right? Can I just so, jump in on that part? The customer in that case is not like when you look at the business's customer, but the customer is like the, the interaction that you're having, the customer being the person uh, the that you are trying to The customer is co-create. whoever is going to give you that permission to achieve great things in this world. And in that case, it was the CEO of Deloitte. But yes, it was also, it was also the customer customer. You always have to have an end state customer in mind. And as I was thinking about our distinguished um, uh, positioning, You had McKinsey, which was the smartest strategic firm. You had Accenture, which was, you know, which was all about the the technology execution. I wanted, I wanted, I felt that we could occupy a place right in the middle, which was all around, you know, people and getting shit done. Um, And really, if you look at Deloitte's practice today, it's very much focused on the people-centric side of things. And it also has strategy. And it also has uh, technology in, in abundance, but you know it's it's got a very people f- first focus mindset, and that's still that's a legacy of thirty years now. Um, so the 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 important thing to recognize is you take a customer. Now, with, now look, that said, if you have a wild ass idea that isn't even in the mind of the bosses that you work with. You can still go for that too. I'm not saying, I'm not saying choke back crazy innovation, right? Um, I'm saying ideate however you want to ideate, but eventually there's a constituency of people that you're going to have to land with. Make sure you're always keeping them in mind. Um, so once you achieve that sense of vision, then you start inviting people into the co-creation process. You know, you develop your team. As I as I saw it, call it, who's your team? Now, you said something earlier, which I was going to mention this. Um, If the people around you aren't playing the game that you want them to play, if they're not behaving like you want them to behave, you don't have the right to abandon ship. You don't have the right to point at them as the reason for your failure. The chapter is called, it's probably my favorite chapter in this whole book. It's called, It's All on You. And And I try to slap you in the face a little bit and make you recognize some of the ridiculous excuses that we use to avoid taking personal responsibility um, for the, the, the people and the relationships that we have. You know, if you've got a boss that is blocking you, what do you need to do to um, get him or her on board? And there's lots of good stories in here, but I, you know, I, I just think about my son. I had a, uh, uh, had a foster, two foster children, one at 12 and one at 16. We got them at 12 and 16. And they're now 21 and 25. And um, if I sat there with my arms crossed and said to that angry 12 year old, you know, um, when you start acting like my son, I'll be your father. It's ridiculous. I mean, you don't, you don't look at the people around you and say, when you start acting the way I want you to act, then I'll start working with you. Bullshit. You got to go 99.9% of the way to get there. Um, And I talk about the six deadly excuses that we use that stop us from being successful. Um, You know, sometimes it looks like hard work. We're just lazy, right? Um, You know, and sometimes we're sitting there thinking we just don't give a damn enough. You know, that's deference. Um, Well, it's also, we think that it's not our role. It's like, oh, that's not my job. Bullshit. Anything's your job. 
I mean, if you any look, Gandhi did a pretty good job as a single individual of making a difference. So did Martin Luther King. The, the idea, and you said it earlier, I love the fact that you, you stitched this together. Every one of us needs to be our own movement leaders. Movement leadership is the principle that I'm advocating for. That's what leadership is of the future. Because movement leaders don't have authority. They earn permission to lead. And there's a whole chapter in this book about earning permission to lead. Um, anyway, I personally, I love, I love the, uh, the deadly sins, the six deadly excuses. Um, yeah. Awesome. And I know, I know our, our, our time is winding down here. I, I have a question. So if we looked at like, you know, the younger people, younger generation, you, you, you've touched on the, it's all on you, the, the caring, the, the role, like any role is your role if you want it to be your role, but you need to take the ownership and it sounds like do the work and then like yep. earn the permission to be a leader there. Yep. What do you say to those businesses that really got hit hard in COVID, the ones that whatever happened? What do you say to them? What do you say to the CEOs that have had to lay off and furlough their employees? Like, you know, and I'm sure it's not just dust yourself off and get back on the horse, but short of the, the miracle, what, what are you seeing there? What are you talking to people? What are they saying to themselves? And, and, and how can we leave this world better than we found it? Well, you know, I have been so inspired by Delta Airlines through all of this, truly. Um, you know, they have uh, defined for me the future of, of leadership in that, you know, they've gone from whatever their size was to whatever their size is today. And, you know, you can only imagine it's, you know, all but, all but de minimis revenue compared to where they were. And now have to rethink about what their footprint is and all of that. <clears throat> but the adherence to these principles of leadership that I talk about in this book, um, Delta is beautifully featured in this book. Their, their chief operating officer, Gil, is amazing. Um, adherence with integrity to a set of principles, even in difficult times, is, is powerful. And, you know, I've had the, I was concerned that I would be furloughing and laying off and reducing salaries. I chose not to. Um, it's painful, but I chose not to. Not, I'm not suggesting this is an answer at all. I mean, I understand many companies have to furlough significantly just to, for shareholder value and to save the companies, which is ultimately important, and that's the job of a leader. But how you do all of this, I, there's a company called LHH, Lee Hecht Harrison, that is um, really an expert in outplacement. So people leading companies and doing it the right way. I've never been, it's not been my expertise, but how you behave in situations like that is as important as how we behave in the good times. In fact, maybe more so, right? It defines who we are as a company. Um, I'd say set, get a set of moral standards and it doesn't mean you can't hurt people. People will be hurt in this process, but it means that you'll be high integrity, transparent, caring, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but the other point, let me go back to the exact, maybe this is a good place to end. The same place that I started with you is the same place that I'll end. There is growth opportunity here, right? Go down a path of leveraging this crisis to figure out what the next growth opportunity is, what the next risk avoidance thing so you don't get even more hit in fourth quarter when everybody's earnings are to crap and your clients, your clients are, are, are shutting down even more than they are now right? Let's be prepared. Let's go into agile sprints. Let's go into co-elevating teams. And the burden doesn't have to be all on your shoulders. The reason I wrote this book is I want you as a leader to lead without authority with a co-elevating group of people around you and with you. And you serve them and they serve you and you all serve the mission. Um, and they serve each other. And that to me is a much better way to do business. To me, I, I put leading without authority and the principle of co-elevation as the way in which I now parent it's the way in which I, uh, I'm single now for five years, uh, but we co-parent our boys. And, um, but my next relationship and my, what will be my last relationship, presumably, is, um, is going to be a co-elevating one, right? I want that for all of us. 
Um, I don't know if, if you're married, Anthony, but it's a good it's a good threshold to put for any relationship of our life, particularly the most important ones. Yeah, I get that. I, I always say that if we're not going to the same place, we're going to different places. And so how can we really co-create the world that we want? And, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, no matter where you're at, I believe you have the opportunity to be able to do that. So our, our listeners, you know, I uh, wherever you're at, you have the power and to create and co-create anything that you want. And, and Keith, I just really want to thank you for uh, not only you know, the inspirational message, but really the steps that people can take to craft the future that they want in a world that has become, in my opinion, more malleable than ever. If you have the um, desire and the intention of bringing people along, because none of us is as smart as all of us, and if you can really get what people want and help them get it, you know, anything is possible. So um, where can people get the book? What are the next steps to connect with you? Uh, virtualteamswin.com, the book yeah. available. Yeah, where else I, can people I, here's, connect with you? Here's what I'd say. The book's available everywhere. Um, yes. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Not so disrupted. On May 26th, the book uh, is shipping probably ship a week before so you can start it's three weeks from now from where this is being podcast is being uh, uh shot but I'm, i would imagine by the time this podcast out it is available right now and it'll be shipped to your home so i'm very excited about that uh, please help me evangelize these principles i think they're very important for this day um so anything you can do post etc appreciate it um virtualteamswin.com is where all of our 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 coaching and instruction to you as a leader who wants to lead this way in a virtual world, all of that is posted there. <clears throat> and there's a lot of good free um, content and all the studies we posted in Harvard Business Review, webinars, et cetera, all there for you. Um, yeah, and that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to get to know you better. Uh, follow me on Instagram if you wanna see my personal life as well as my professional life. Follow me on LinkedIn. If uh, you wanna get my tips, just let me know. Excellent. Thank you so much, Keith. And, and you know what, I, again, I took from, away from this is, is leading without authority. You know, while this is a business podcast, I think this, this situation has uncovered all of our humanity. So whether a father, mother, brother, sister, community leader, friend, you know, you can make a difference. You can really change somebody's life by taking these principles. And it's not just about creating the bottom line, but, you know, increasing people's quality of life and the connection you have one-to-one, -one, which is really that immeasurable stuff um, I think is, is applicable to all of it. So Keith, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a, a truly a, a pleasure and an honor and, and thank you for your time today. You've been super generous. Anthony, thank you very much. My pleasure. My guest today has been Keith Ferrazzi, who is the CEO of Ferrazzi Greenlight and the author of Leading Without Authority, How the New Power of Co-Elevation Can Break Down Silos, Transform Teams, and Reinvent Collaboration.